Hello everyone, welcome to Midwestern Mart's YouTube channel. My name's Eddie Smith. I'm super pumped about this video today. Uh, I just finished che, um, sorry, John Lee Anderson's book, Che, um, A Revolutionary Life, which is the story of Che Guevara, basically. So John Lee Anderson, uh, his biographer, went and lived in Havana, Cuba, um, went to all the primary sources he could, spoke with everyone um, who's still alive who knew Che, um, and, and mem surviving members of his family, um, dug through Cuban records and everything that's been released on Che by the Cuban government and, and others, um, and, and did a ton of historical research as well, because obviously there was a lot of things going on politically, and Che was heavily involved in all those things. So the legacy of Che, um, it depends on who you ask, you know, if they tell you whether he was good or bad, you know, there's, um, in Latin America, he's viewed as a sort of, uh, revolutionary hero. Um, a lot of college students, you know, wear him on their shirts or whatever. They kind of commodify him or whatever. Um, and, or aestheticize him, I should say. And, you know, conservatives will critique that and say, oh, you don't know, this was a mass murder. You know, there was famously a television show in the West who compared him to Hitler, who said if you wore Che Guevara's um, on your shirt in Latin America or Cuba or whatever, it'd be like wearing Hitler, which is laughably wrong. Um, and, and that's made clear in this book. But then also, you know, of course, there are the socialists who will defend Che's legacy as if he's literally some sort of God. Um, but you're really going to see why um, as I explain this or if you read this book. I mean, the man was actually incredible, um, about as incredible as a flawed, living, breathing human being can be. Um, and he he made his mistakes and I have small areas where I disagree with him and I'll talk about those. Um, but yeah, truly incredible and inspiring person. I really um, recommend picking this book up. And the author's not a Marxist, but it's good to read stuff by non-Marxists, especially history. Um, and he just did an incredible job finding sources for this. So the book starts out talking about Che's early life. And of course, Che was born into an aristocratic family. His family was pretty wealthy, um, but he was always sort of an outsider. You know, he didn't like to, he didn't shower all the time. He wasn't um, high society, you know, um, he liked to read, he liked to study. Um, and he wanted to become a doctor because he had crippling asthma. And everyone said this about him from a young age when he played rugby, when he played sports. He couldn't necessarily keep up with the other kids because of his asthma, but he would just try so hard all the time. You know, he would give it his all. And just being able to compete was a win for him because, you know, he would bend over and be wheezing all the time. And that asthma was something that followed him all through his life, which obviously um, fighting... He fought in three different guerrilla wars, um, so it's pretty incredible what he was able to do, and he basically just had to carry on morphine, or I think it was, or no, no, adrenaline, I think, I don't know, he would inject himself with something every time he was having a really bad asthma attack. Um, so the book uh, talks about his childhood a bit, and then it gets into the, what are, what Che details in his diaries, the motorcycle diaries, which have been turned into a movie. Uh, which is where he traveled across Latin America, um, training as a doctor, volunteering himself, um, going through Argentina, uh, and, and basically traveling through uh, most of the continent um, on a motorcycle um, uh, as he's treating people. And he notices, he just starts to notice, you know, everything about his country, as in how impoverished the peasants are, uh, how impoverished the workers are. Um, and he, he sees these what he calls capitalist octopuses or octopi um where these these companies based in the west reach their tentacles their octopus tentacles into latin america and um they're extracting the resources out of latin america and using it to enrich these companies in the west and that's what che calls the octopus um and there are all these what are called monopsonies where the company owns everything, right? Uh, you work for this company and they own the house you live in, the stores you shop at, uh, the medical clinics. And Che talks about speaking with this woman who he's trying to treat, you know, she's ill um, and she, she works at one of these companies and they just stop, you know, stop treating her at the hospital because they see her as, as she's on her way out. So they're like, ah, who really cares? You know, she's not going to provide us any more cheap labor. And they stop treating her and Che watches this woman die. Um, and he talks about um, the brutality and the violence of poverty, right? And, and this is when he starts developing his anti-capitalist mindset. When he starts saying things like, I vow in front of a picture of Comrade Stalin to destroy these capitalist octopuses. 
Um, he starts to, to see the U.S. as the reason, um, or not the U.S., but private capital. At first, it's the U.S. He mentions something like he thinks dark princes or, or evil spirits or whatever are controlling the U.S., um, but, but traveling across Latin America and also reading Marx, uh, he starts to put it together in his head um, that this is capitalism, that the evil's keeping his country impoverished and causing these people to die um, because they don't have health care um, is because of capitalism. And, and that's when he starts to become a Marxist. So um, during the motorcycle diaries, uh, while he's traveling around, he writes something racist. I can't remember exactly what he wrote, but he sees um, people of color for the first time in the Caribbean. And this is what people like Steven Crowder will use to say, oh, Che was a racist. He hated black people. You know, he was he grew up in Argentina. He was like 23, 24 years old when he said that. And he was seeing a black person uh, for the very first time in his life in the Caribbean. And he said some reactionary things. But then later in his life would go and fight in a revolution in the Congo, you know, side by side with with black people for black liberation, um, you know, of, of the place where they were being colonized by the West, you know, in the West where we have these loud mouths like Steven Crowder who can just spew nonsense um, like that. So he, he did have reactionary views at first, but that was just, you know, a product of the culture and a product of him growing up. Um, and it's honestly a good example because he, it shows, you know, you can, you can have some reactionary views that you don't mean to have, but you can educate yourself and grow out of them, um, which Che did. Uh, so Che is actually in Guatemala, too, for the Guatemalan coup. So uh, Guatemala is basically owned by the uh, United Fruit Company. So this is one of the largest capitalist octopuses. Um, they or is it octopi? I think it's octopi, but I, I swear Che says octopuses. But anyways, United Fruit Company is basically this giant um, plantation that uh, monopsony, like we were saying, who sell fruit out of Guatemala and other uh, surrounding countries. And Jacobo Arbenz comes to power peacefully um, and he nationalizes uh, only areas of land that the United Fruit Company wasn't even using. Right. So areas that um, the United Fruit Company had under their ownership that they weren't using, he redistributed to the farmers. And immediately, uh, the U.S. backed a coup. Uh, I think it was Jose Castillo Armas, Jorge Castillo Armas, something Castillo Armas. Um, the CIA starts backing this guy. And part of what they do is they fly planes over Guatemala and they drop leaflets in um, that are anti Jacobo Arbenz propaganda, right? When we talk about the battle sometimes to control the media, right? The media is an apparatus and they can push kind of any agenda they want. And any time the U.S. does regime change, they do a propaganda campaign in the country we're trying to do regime change in. Um, and this is an example of that. And Che has to seek, uh, seek asylum in the embassy. And when he's in the embassy, the CIA is telling Castillo Armas, this dictator who just took power, um, kill all of them. Take all the, the leftists who are in the embassies and execute them. And Armas won't because he fears that that'll get him deposed, that that'll cause a mass uprising. And one of the people in the embassies was Che. Um, so the U.S. learns from this lesson. And after Che, they become much more brutal with their actions in Latin America um, because they realize, you know, if they would have gone ahead and executed everyone, uh, Che Guevara would have never happened and potentially the Cuban Revolution would have never happened. So when, when Che meets Fidel and he actually decides to go over on the grandma or grand, grandma, grandma, I don't know, this, this boat they go to Cuba on, um, he says he decides to follow Fidel because Fidel was the one who wanted to stop whining and fight, right? A lot of the communist parties at the time uh, were trying to take power through democratic means, um, voting, and it was just going slow. And anytime they got someone in, like our Benz, the CIA would depose them. And Che starts, um, he's also reading Lenin, and he starts saying, you have to stop trusting the U.S., right? Our number one thing needs to be anti-imperialism. If we really, really want to create a new system that's better for all of Latin America, we need to kick the U.S. out of here. We need to get rid of these octopuses. And he starts, um, um, but a lot of the Communist Party at the time in Latin America didn't really have this view. You know, they're like, we can work with the U.S., uh, we can elect enough communists through voting, and then we can start to redistribute the wealth. And I mean, Che was really right there every single time, you know, uh, a socialist leader was elected in Latin America, the CIA immediately deposed them. Um, the other one that comes to mind is Salvador Allende in 1970, who was replaced with Augusto Pinochet in 73, one of the most uh, brutal dictators of all time. Um, so when they first leave on the Granma, they have 22 guys, right? Um, but, but when they get there and they start fighting against the Fulgencio Batista military dictatorship, um, they are recruiting the peasants. Um, so Cuba 
is essentially all these, what are basically slave plantations, Western companies um, uh, harvesting sugar and tobacco. And, and one that makes Cuba soil so it can only grow sugar and tobacco for years, which is gonna really hurt them uh, when the US puts them under an embargo post-revolution. Um, but two, they were able to turn the peasants against these plantation owners and against the Fulgencio Batista military dictatorship really easily. And Che says that anytime you show a peasant compassion and you treat them like a human being, they take to you right away because these people were so used to being treated like they weren't humans, uh, like, they, like they were machines, um, all for the, the enrichment of, of Western companies. Um, so they were, they were able to turn the peasants against the plantation owners, which obviously Che is a Marxist-Leninist, and, and in Lenin's book, it says he's very clear that you need the support of the masses. You need the support of the proletariat, and you need, or, and or you need the support of the peasants if you're gonna have a successful revolution, right? It can't come from the top down, it has to come from the bottom up. And this is exactly what they did, right? They, they um, started with 22 guys, and by the end they had hundreds, you know, and this a whole infrastructure built for guerrilla warfare in the Sierra Maestra Mountains. Um, so they turned the peasants against them, created a revolution, um, and, and uh, during the during the revolution that was going on, you hear a lot um, of, of anti-communists, a lot of anti-Cuba people said Che was a mass murderer, right? He loved executing people. He would just line people up and shoot them in the head, and it was his favorite thing to do. Not quite. <laughs> so um, the, that story happens when, when they have a prisoner who, who I believe either killed one of their men or um, he was in some kind of situation where they couldn't let him live, right? It was, it was uh, they were in, at war um, and, and this was one of the enemies. I can't remember exactly what it is, but either way, Fidel says somebody has to kill this guy, right? Um, we, we, somebody needs to execute him and nobody wants to do it. And, and Che volunteers and says, you know, I'm willing to dedicate myself for the revolution. I don't like killing um, or whatever, but, but I'm willing to do it in order to free my country from the plantations and free my country from Western dominance. And these people we're killing are selling their country out to the West, right? And they're, they're oppressing the peasants, treating them like dirt, uh, treating them like slaves. I like to make the comparison to the Civil War, right? Would you say Abraham Lincoln was a mass murderer? Or another one is George Washington. George Washington executed um, multiple members of the enemy army um, um, during the war. And it was a revolutionary war, you know, um, and it's a, a moral gray area for sure. But, you know, these people act like Che just loves shooting people in the head, you know, but really he wanted to, he, in his mind, he was saying, if I'm going to ask people to fight and die for the revolution, I need to be able to kill for the revolution too. Because how, um, how can I ask them to to do something that I can't do myself. Um, so, you know, war is brutal, it's terrible, uh, but this is what happened. And and it was, you know, it, it did free so many slaves, <laughs> I mean, peasant slaves, and it, and it turned Cuba into a place with doctor's offices who export more doctors than anywhere around the world. So, you know, um, revolutions happen and, and people die um, and it, it's sad, but to act like this was some mass murderer who just like got off on killing, not true at all. It was, a, you know, he waited in his mind in order to free my country from the West, in order to free my country from the plantations, people are gonna need to be shot. Um, so yeah, he wasn't Fidel's personal executioner, you know, he didn't perform all the executions. Normally they would do it by, you know, if someone needed to be executed, which they tried to let as many people go as possible, and they let a ton of people go, uh, maybe too many people go sometimes, honestly, um, they would do it by firing squad, so nobody had to, had to feel the guilt, right? Um, so Che was incredibly tough and harsh, but also kind. Uh, everyone looked up to him, but he expected everyone around him, you know, to be a fully dedicated revolutionary. Like I was just saying, he expected them to, to put the revolution above their own lives, right? And, and that's what you need if, if you're going to go through the jungle and fight a guerrilla war against the military dictatorship with, with funding and backing from the CIA and, and the U.S., the world's largest uh, military. So he asked a lot of his soldiers and he would often say things that were hurtful to them because people looked up to him so much and he would scold them and, and grown men, you know, would cry because they wanted Che to respect them so bad. Um, and, and he, Che, Che really had this belief uh, in the new man um, that, that capitalism trains us to be individualistic, 
um, and look out for only ourselves. Um, and under socialism and communism, we need to create a new man, a man who, who will, is willing to die for those around him, for his community in order to make the world a better place. A man who's uh, free of ego, and not to say Che was completely free of ego, of course not, but um, he tried to exemplify what he wanted society to be. Fidel has a quote like, Che was a man from the future, right? He, he, he saw what he wanted, the direction he wanted society to go, and he tried to exemplify that in his personal life, and the people he respected the most uh, around him were people who also did that, and who also, who also read Marx. Um, and they talk about the Sino-Soviet split quite a bit when China split with the Soviet Union, and Fidel and Cuba post-revolution um, like I said, they could only really trans or grow sugar. Um, it was monocropic uh, um, because of how long the plantations had been extracting sugar out of Cuba and selling it in the West. Um, now their, their soil could really only grow sugar and the Soviet Union uh, were the ones who agreed to buy that sugar. Uh, so Fidel kind of had to be allied with the Soviets when Che was saying, no, the Soviets, he, he one, predicted that the Soviet Union would collapse because they were allowing too much private capital in the country, which happened. Um, and then he said, two, there was nothing to create the new man, right? Like Mao had all these ideas about new democracy, um, about cultural revolution um, and, and changing kind of the mindset of the people to, to think more collectively and less individualistic. Um, and that was what Che felt was essential to socialism, and he thought that's what one of the major things that the Soviet Union was missing. That so the Soviet Union did these things for workers. They created health care, they industrialized, uh, they created education, but um, uh, they, they didn't create a new man, right? They didn't create a, a new mode of production, a new kind of, of life, a new kind of society, really. It was mostly bureaucratic uh, state capitalism, whereas he felt China was doing a much better job. Um, yeah, so, so he also gets to visit um, a lot of areas or a lot of socialist um, places around the world, or, or even nationalist places. Which is really interesting if you're into history. He visits Nasser in Egypt. Um, he he kind of likes Nasser. He visits uh, Sukarno in Indonesia and says that Sukarno is living too lavishly um, <laughs> uh, for to be a real people's leader. And Che was just like he would just say this stuff to the the world leaders' faces, and everyone around him would be like, Che, like, don't say that. But he just <laughs> did not care. You know, he would tell him like, oh, he would tell the Soviets all the time like, oh, you guys are living too nice to be government officials, right? You should. Live of like the working men um hilarious <laughs> but he also talks about like i said china and the soviet union but then he visits pyongyang and the dprk and he has a really good description of them he's like it's a bit despotic but it, it, they are building socialism so we think of north korea you know he was like they're basically worshiping the un family um or sorry the not the un family it's kim, the kim family um and it's pretty authoritarian but they are building socialism and they are anti-imperialist and the Korean War, um, you know, massacred 20% of their population because the U.S. was trying to take power. Um, so pretty interesting analysis there. And then eventually Che just basically gets bored um, and frustrated with being in the Cuban government after the revolution. Um, he's filling his role as the minister of the ind of industry. And, and he has this vision that's basically, if you know what Pan-Africanism is, where, you know, you unite the idea is you unite all of Africa because Africa has been divided by colonial powers um, and you create one strong country that can develop with a with um, a state apparatus to defend themselves from the West, uh, from colonialism. And this is what basically Che thought was going to happen in Latin America through guerrilla warfare. Um, so so he wrote a ton about guerrilla warfare, um, trying to add to the science of Marxism, Leninism, saying this is an option here um, for what we can do in Latin America. You know, um, we need to start launching these guerrilla groups. And ultimately, the U.S. just got really, really good at massacring guerrilla groups, one, uh, and torturing people and propaganda campaigns against them. Um, and then two is uh, the people in Cuba were special. The 22 people who left on the grandma um, were extremely tough, um, extremely talented revolutionaries, um, and, and they, they also got really lucky. I mean, there was a lot of luck involved. They almost died many, many times. Um, but Che leaves for the Congo eventually. Um, after the U.S. and Belgium assassinated Patrice Lumumba, um, there's still all these revolutionary movements going around. 
So Che leaves his position high up in government, where, by the way, he was only accepting workmen's wages. Um, <laughs> and also, this is another funny story. The wealthiest plantation owner in all of Cuba, before they go ahead with the land reforms and start redistributing land to the peasants and nationalizing a lot of it, the... He, Che takes the richest plantation owner in Cuba and says, hey, we're going to take your land, but if you just want to work um, with everyone else and be part of the revolution, we'd like to offer you that, you know, but you'll only get paid $2,000 a month or whatever. And the guy's like, oh, I'm good, and then leaves for Miami. But they didn't even kill the wealthiest plantation owner in Cuba, you know, which is why there's so many Miami Cubans right now who talk about how Cuba's this evil dictatorship. Um, because they just let a lot of these wealthy plantation owners go and gave all their land back to the peasants or, or nationalized it and took it into state hands. Um, so Che, uh, again, leaves for the Congo. And there's just so much division and corruption in the Congo. And the soldiers just weren't as with it. You know, uh, they were not dedicated to the revolution. Basically the opposite of the new man that, that Che thought about. And they distrusted him because he was an outsider. You know, he was an Argentinian or Argentine in, in Cuba, but he was able to win their respect. When he was in the Congo, uh, it wasn't the same. You know, people just didn't listen to him. He had trouble training up soldiers uh, to be what he wanted. And it was basically a disaster. Um, and eventually Che had to flee flee the Congo and, and give that up. And immediately after he, he finishes in the Congo, um, he goes to Bolivia because, again, he's frustrated with this lack of initiative to launch guerrilla groups. You know, the Soviets are telling him, chill, Che, and Cuba's like, chill. Um, Fidel's like, please stop saying you're pro-China. <laughs> you know, we need to be allied with the Soviets who don't like China right now. Um, and Che's like, I don't care. Yeah, I just say what I want, and we need to launch these guerrilla movements. So he goes to Bolivia. Again, it's a disaster. The CIA finds out he's there, starts funneling tons and tons of money into Bolivia to get him. Um, he, he wanders through the jungle for months before eventually he's found. Um, and his last words, of course, are, shoot coward, you're only going to kill a man. Um, because they take him and they interrogate him. Um, he says a couple other cool things. He, they're holding him in a school. A, um, a, yeah, a, a school. And the teacher is there of the school. And he goes, look, points at the blackboard as he's tied up about to be executed. And he goes, you have a grammar mistake on your blackboard. If this was in Cuba, like we would have better education. <laughs> so even in death, he was one hilarious and two defiant. Um, and, and he really was just ready to, um, to sac he was prepared to sacrifice his life for the revolution. Um, so they shot him cut off his hands and actually John Lee Anderson wrote this book as they found where Che's body was buried. Uh, they hid his body um, and tried to make it look like he was killed in battle for a long time before they finally um, revealed that the CIA um, CIA operative had executed him. Um, so I have a, uh, that's basically a summary of the book. Um, I have a few critiques of John Lee Anderson, the, the biographer. He's a great biographer and he did a great job, uh, but he's not a Marxist. So I think there's some things that he misses. Um, one, he takes a lot of pot shots at Fidel Castro, you know, like Fidel will do something innocuous, like bring him to me, Che. And, and John Lee Anderson will be like Fidel showing his authoritarian attitude or whatever, which is pretty typical of Western authors to just throw in kind of random anti-communist pot shots. Uh, but it is what it is. It doesn't take away from the book that much. And then there's one one part that I really uh, got frustrated with where he's talking about freedom, right? Um, I think he's talking about when John Paul Sartre comes and visits Cuba. And in Havana, um, right, uh, um, under Batista, there were all these nightclubs and these brothels uh, and these prostitutes uh, and in Havana. And it was this crazy place for rich people to go party, basically, and, and tourists. And post-revolution, he says, all those are gone. And there are people, you know, training for when the U.S. invades, the military's training. And he says, there's less freedom now. And it's like, hold on a second. You know, freedom's not this concept you can analyze in the abstract. Sure, there's less freedom for the plantation owners who can no longer go to Havana and, and pay a prostitute who's selling her body because of the economic despair that she lives in. Um, there's less freedom for them, but there's more freedom for the literal slaves. You're telling, you know, you're, you're really going to say there's less freedom now that the slaves are free, but they took away brothels and nightclubs. Like, no, there's more freedom for the slaves. There's less freedom um, for the uh, the plantation owners to live lives of luxury, exploiting, um, exploiting the sex work of, of poor Cuban girls. Um, so I thought that was that kind of frustrated me. Um, I think he downplays the CIA influence a little bit. 
he'll just like, you know, and there's so, this book is so dense. There's so much that goes on in it. He'll just kind of mention really crazy things that happened. And it seems like it's just in passing because there's so much that happened in Che's life, but he really will just be like, um, and then the CIA dumped $2 million into this country or they, and then the CIA dropped bombs on all over Guatemala. It's like, wait, hold on a second. Like, let's, Take a second to address how crazy that is that the U.S., you know, Che is viewed as some evil dictator or some evil murderer for trying to kick the U.S. out of his country. And the U.S. is funneling millions of dollars into literally fascist right wing groups and dropping bombs on countries because they want to develop themselves. You know, so who's the real the real authoritarian dictatorship here um, putting the rest of the, the world under their boot? Um, you know, it's the U.S. And I, and I wish you would focus on what the CIA did a little more, but also it's a 730 page book. So, I mean, he did fine. <laughs> so and then there's one thing where I thought he, you know, he's not a Marxist. And I thought it showed that he hadn't read Marx. He, he says something along the lines of Che had added the idea of violence to the theory of Marxism or Marxism Leninism. Right. The need that we need to have a violent revolution and, and then hold the revolution um by by countering when we're attacked, you know, using violence to defend ourselves. Um, and that's not true. That's what Lenin said. All right. Lenin said that in 1917 in this book. It's very clear. He says you need to seize state power and then you need to defend yourselves. Right. You need to centralize the military and defend yourselves, defend the revolution. Che's whole thing was guerrilla warfare at, and specifically to Latin America. Um, and he was really dedicated to it, but he didn't believe like it was the only way, right? I don't think he thought guerrilla wars were going to liberate every country in the world. Uh, he saw it as a way to unite Latin America. He thought um, all of Latin American countries could have guerrilla wars, kick the U.S. companies out, and, and then create socialism the same way Cuba did. And then they could be in fraternity with each other. So when the U.S. is putting an embargo on Cuba and all they can do is sell sugar to the Soviet Union, um, they can look to their, their neighbors in Latin America, um, and in the Caribbean for for economic support um and that was Che's ultimate dream um and that's what I would say he added to the science of Marxism Leninism not violence uh that was that was Lenin um and and then yeah so I'll, I'll finish here with any critiques I have of Che or or responding to some of the critiques you hear of him one is that he was homophobic I mean yeah 99.9% .9 of Argentine people or Cubans at the time were uh, it was just part of the culture, you know, and it's just like, they just use like slurs when they're talking about people who they think are wimpy, right? But, um, and ultimately Cuba became one of the very first countries to, uh, to do, to legalize gay marriage. And then now they have government funded like transitioning facilities for transgender people. Um, so, so ultimately, you know, what he did advanced the plight of gay people, or I mean, uh, LGBTQ plus people, um, a ton. Uh, even though he, he had these homophobic leanings himself because he was growing up in the 60s. He grew up in the, the 40s and then was living in the 50s and 60s. Um, and then uh, the there's accusations that I already addressed of him being racist. I mean, racist people don't go fight side by side in with people in the Congo who they've never met before to liberate them from imperialism. Um, that's not a racist thing to do. Nobody racist um, would feel that the entire continent of, well, that's not true. I shouldn't say nobody racist would think this. Maybe they do, who knows? But he thought the entire continent of Africa you need, needed to be united against Western imperialism and develop themselves and, and turn themselves into a powerful developed nation. Um, united against capitalism uh so yeah not a really racist view there um and he said the racist things when he saw pe black people in the caribbean for the first time um but of course later changed his views as he grew out of that um as we all can grow uh my my one uh actual critique of che would be he a he had a little bit of adventurism in him uh he was obsessed with the guerrilla option right he was obsessed with his theory that guerrilla warfare would be um, victorious in Latin America and that it would liberate them all. And John Lee Anderson actually ends with something really cool saying like, you know, maybe maybe Che's guerrilla option hasn't come to fruition the way he thought it would, but he's still, you know, a revolutionary and inspiring person. And actually John Lee Anderson brings up uh, Hugo Chavez, Evo Morales, and uh, who's the other one? I can't remember. But he brings up these these people in Latin America who were democratically elected, right? And since we've seen a coup of Evo Morales and we've seen attempted coups of Hugo Chavez and Maduro, and we see the U.S. Um, crushing them 
with economic sanctions. So they're still fighting, right? But but the revolution has not died, right? And there and there are still guerrilla movements, especially in Colombia, which is a super far right pro U.S. government. Um, there's there's guerrilla movements and there's people fighting these political battles. Um, which is interesting that how he that's how he ends it because that is what this book is about the new mole paths of the latin american left um basically like we have marxism leninism and we have che Guevara's theories of guerrilla warfare but what's next right how can we how can we kick western companies out post operation condor where the u.s has tortured and killed hundreds of thousands of leftists um you know a lot of these guerrilla movements like che's fell apart and basically the conclusion Amir Sadr, the, the author of this comes to, is that you need to fight every single battle, right? Um, you need to fight the political battle. You need to fight the grassroots organizing battle. You need to do mutual aid. You need to organize through the trade unions. You can do um, guerrilla tactics. I don't think guerrilla tactics are smart in the United States, by the way. But, but um, basically you need to do all these things in order to push for the revolution. Um, in Venezuela, they have 2,000 communes who try and stay strong to build collective consciousness who are allied with the state. Um, things like this, you know, alternative ways of building socialism and building on on the legacy of Che and, and looking to kick, you know, Western imperialists out of Latin America. And obviously, if you live in the West like me, our job is to have socialist revolution here um, because we live in the imperial core. And if we can turn this into a dictatorship of the proletariat, you know, a, a worker state um, and stop oppressing all these places around the world, that's going to free up all these places around the world who no longer um, have to deal with millions of dollars flowing into their country from the CIA and all these these undercover CIA agents trying to destabilize their country every time they elect a leader who's going to develop them. All right. Well, that's all I got for today. I hope you all enjoyed. Uh, this is Che Guevara, A Revolutionary Life by John Lee Anderson. Check it out. I mean, I highly recommend it. He's not a Marxist, but um, I mean, reading history is super important, um, especially if you call yourself a historical materialist. Um, and this is some a way to get some historical materialism in your brain. Learn a lot about Cuba and learn about one of the most inspiring leaders we've ever had on the left as socialists. So, yep, hope you guys like that. Um, peace out. Viva la revolution.